monitor over here. But we're gonna talk about body flips. I just dive right into the good stuff. I don't mess around. We're gonna talk about blood, menstrual blood, which is just obviously another type of blood, semen, urine, and a mystery substance. So many people, when they see blood, become alarmed and they go into panic mode. Oh, oh she's <laughs> Literally, it's a drop of blood. People freak out. I don't. I'm just like, whatever, get a band -aid. But the sight and smell ignites something primal in us, as it always does. Um, and it does it in animals, too. You see it in, in a lot of times in dogs, but cats will exhibit it. And I don't really pay attention to other animals in my life. I have children. So I don't have a lot of time to deal with what other animals get primal when they see blood. But blood represents life and death. It is vital in terms of mortality, which makes it a very significant ingredient in magic. And as much as, mag as sex sells, so does blood. Our most popular media monetize blood and gore. They just turn it into a Hollywood thing and it's not always what it's about. Uh, in ancient history, blood was used to appease the gods of nature. Well, the old rites of sacrificing animals and people are no longer necessary, it shows just how important blood was and is to our collective unconscious. Ancient societies performed blood sacrifice to pacify the gods and the earth in order to keep crops growing and to keep food abundant. The Mayans would pierce their lips, tongues, cheeks, um, to draw blood, which was spread upon pictures, or not pictures, statues of deities, and then sprinkled also on the earth or given to divinity. When the topic of blood comes up, people's thoughts go to the scary place, or they begin thinking about Hollywood and the virgin sacrifices that are made in all those 1980s campy horror films that I am absolutely a huge fan of. Um, but in reality, blood magic can be used in many ways, not just frightening and or painful. In fact, it works for love, which lets you get on a little insight. Love magic sounds wonderful, but you're taking away the free will of another person, so that makes it dark magic. Love magic is not light, and I love that. But I'm also a true romantic at heart, so I really, really hate doing love spells. I believe in true love. Now, I can put you into, I, I can do a love spell that'll put two people in the same place at the same time, and the rest is up to you, but you have to pay me my actual going rate to want to do love spells that make you guys fall in love forever and ever. Um, because of all the negativity and fear surrounding blood, most modern day practitioners don't talk about it out of fear of judgment. Even in some witch circles, the subject is considered taboo. Uh, when practiced safely and responsibly by consenting adults, blood magic can be very powerful. The DNA in our blood contains your whole inherited lineage. This means every ancestor you have is present in your blood, making it a substance that reaches back further into time than we can conceive of. I have traced my ancestors back so far to the 1500s, which is not forever and ever, but even that is a time period I can't, I can't comprehend, like, what their life was like and how different it was. I haven't fully wrapped my head around that. But all of that is in me. That is what makes our DNA. Not everyone will choose to use blood, and that's okay. Because we will talk about other substances that you can use. Um, but adding a drop of blood to your oil, a drop. We're not talking slitting anything. We're talking go get a diabetes lancet, a drop of blood. Um, if you're using your own. To oil spells charms because it acts as a binding agent between your physical earthly self and the energy of the spell. Blood can add a level of deep vitality, and for some, it's sacrifice. And we'll be talking about sacrifice in a bit. 
Um, some it's about the power of the ancestors, and for others it's about having the life force, the true living essence of their intended target. Now, I'm all for doing dark, evil, scary things, but nobody's having fun and doing dark, evil, scary things if we're not talking about safety, so just a quick side note on safety. Don't mix your blood with another person's on your body. Like, you know, back when we were kids, we probably, like, drew a drop of blood and touched another person and you made a blood oath or you slit your pump, whatever. Don't do that. It is 2023. Gross. Mix it in a cup or in the spell ingredients or whatever. Don't touch another person unless you absolutely are 100% certain it is safe and even then gross. Use a sterile lens set. Cutting or picking or pricking yourself with a larger knife or razor is not recommended. Using a drop of blood in a ritual is not the same as self-harm. Blood magic is special, it's not routine, and it's used for ceremonial purposes, not as a reason to cut yourself. That is the difference. We are not talking about razor blades and things we're talking about just what the doctor would get. When they test your iron, if you're, especially if you're a female, um, you know, you get that drop of blood, that's good. We do not advocate doing it on a regular basis. Now, for those of you lucky enough to have someone who has a uterus in your life, for me, it's my teenage children because my uterus is gone, um, you can use a menstrual blood. It's even less desirably, it's less talked about. It is more taboo than regular blood because some see it as unclean. They're like, gross. Do you know where that comes from? Yeah, same place the blood on my finger does, actually. So, but, um, so not even, not every witch uses blood magic and even less will use menstrual blood. It is two viewpoints, which one is yay cool, and the other was ew gross, which is fine. Um, Those who use it view it as an incredible source of lunar power and connection to the divine feminine, and well, we know what the other side thinks. To many who use menstrual blood, the opinion that menstrual blood is shameful is a twisted belief invented by the patriarchy out of fear. And this isn't just, you know, down to patriarchy. We'll get to some things here in just a moment to show how far back it goes. Looking back through history, the ability to create and give life used to be revered as the most sacred act amongst all people. No one ever thought otherwise way back when. Over time, it grew out of its revered state. And some, you now it's kind of two camps. There's not really a lot of middle ground. For one, people worship um, the pregnant person and the life cycles of the menstrual cycle and others they have shunned as unclean unworthy and gross and now it has become downgraded to one of the lowest bodily functions which is very sad but why is it all the controversy? So early civilizations know nothing of the science we know today. Okay, we all know that. They believe that when a woman stopped bleeding for nine months, that the blood was being used to make the baby. Not to feed the baby, not to house the baby, it was actually creating the baby, like holding it out of play. That's what they thought, which understandably with their scientific knowledge at the time, makes sense. So to them, Blood from a womb was used, was the source of life itself. The Greeks and Romans believed that menstruating women had the power to calm storms, rescue lo- and rescue lost ships at sea. There's evidence that even pharaohs and Celtic kings believed that consuming or drinking menstrual blood would grant them immortality. In some cultures, a girl's first menses was and is a cause for celebration. There are still some covens out there that I have researched that still do a moon cycle for a girl's first menstrual cycle, or moon ceremony. So the fear and loathing part of menstrual blood, which, you know, it's not unique. 
Many ancient religions refer to menstruating people as unclean or cursed. Tiny the Elder, he is our first patriarch to really kind of bring us down. Tiny the Elder, he was a Roman. He published Natural History and included his bizarre thoughts on menstruation. And that's what's helped create the views of modern menstruation. Um, he claimed that instead of light, the blood could make seed and fertile, kill insects and plants in contact, make crops fail, and drive dogs mad. That's insane. That's a lot. When all you're doing is cleansing your body or holding a baby. Like, so strange. But he must, I don't know who scared him so bad that he had these thoughts, but somebody did. Because he also stated that the gaze of a menstruating woman could kill cattle and cause miscarriages, and that period sex could kill a man. <laughs> man, that is some, um, woof, that's some deep, twisted views there. And like, somebody hurt his little feelings. That is for dang sure. But how does all of this tie in with magic? That's why we're here to witchcraft school. Well, a menstrual cycle is in correspondence with the moon cycle. For the majority of people, I unfortunately was not one of them. Different times in a menstrual cycle can be utilized exactly the same way as the phases of the moon influence spell work. It's just one big cycle of life, death, and rebirth, all in the human body. It is both life-giving and death-bringing, all in one substance. But don't worry, if you don't have a uterus, we have something for you, too. Semen. It is almost the male equivalent of Mr. Mr. Blood. Same parts of the body, but y'all men with penises do not carry a baby in your womb, so it's not quite the same thing. But no one has ever accused semen of destroying crops or killing livestock. Ever. Ever. He's never been accused of that. Um, but semen, like Mr. Blood, creates life. The use of it in magic goes almost back to the beginning of time. But we just don't talk about it in modern circles. It's taboo. It's not what classy people do. I will tell you no one's ever accused me of being classy because I just talk about semen and menstrual blood on a regular basis, sadly. Um, despite not reaching the same emotional reactions of, ooh, it's gross, yay, it's cool, you know, it's still a very valuable ingredient to spill all over the world. Semen is the symbol of the divine masculinity. It does not mean male or female. We're talking about divine characters as the archetypes. In one class, Jesse and I discovered we use a lot of masculine spells. You know, we're like, nope, we're, that's a masculine spell. Nope, we're going to do that one as masculine. We like to go in there with those stronger qualities that is represented by the archetype. And that is what we're talking about here. Um, but semen can boost the strength of a spell, just like blood can. You can know, like candles, really good for love spells. You can also use it on a dried piece of cloth and add it to a poppet or a charm. Um, a poppet, for those who are unaware, is just old-fashioned voodoo doll, but not culturally appropriated. Um, semen is also used for fertility spells. Not just procreation, but anything you are trying to bring growth to. Add it to your plans. New beginnings, job prospects, relationships, anything that needs to be encouraged and fertilized to grow, you can use all of these fluids. Blood, menstrual blood, semen, vaginal fluid. All of them. Semen is also good for dominant spells or when you want to mark your territory. This is best done with your own semen if you're marking a territory. You know, let's just be realistic. Uh, you can use semen from a donor. 
usually again with consent, but again, how you obtain the semen is up to you. Don't purchase it on the internet is my suggestion. Yeah. I don't have voice of I mean anymore. I had a stepson, but I cannot imagine going to my really teenage creepy person son and be like, he smells so bad I wouldn't even want his stuff. Like gross. And my husband does not produce semen because he has no prostate. So any semen cells in this house are not happening. Like, I just have to admit that in life, but thankfully I have the girls to make up the difference. And they literally all of them are like, oh my god, mom, whatever, here you go. Like they don't they don't even flinch. Um a simple ritual to help achieve goals to take some semen, energetically feed it with your intention, and then bury it. Pretty simple. You can do the same with the vaginal fluids. Like, that's fine. And then, we're going to talk about urine. Everybody creates urine. You don't have to worry about what your gender. Much like semen, it's used to assert dominance. It can be used in magic to mark a person, idea, or thing as belonging to you. It isn't only about marking your territory, it is also about the process of locating a suitable mate, which means urine is good for love spells. But when you think about um, marking your territory and dominance and finding a mate, that is exactly what happens in nature amongst other animals. As not as humans, we tend to dress up and put on something fancy and strut our stuff like a peacock, but most of the wild animal kingdom marks their territory and urinates on trees, on, in the case of a billy goat, he urinates on his own beard, um, all those different things to assert that. 10 out of 10, don't recommend smelling a billy goat. Some examples, um, let's see, oh, urine is also full of the body's garbage, so well, it has made a track from pheromones, you're also getting wet or waste product, products, so back when I was 12 or 13 and didn't really know what magic was because I grew up in Idaho and they had no opinion on this, there was no books, um, I told my parents that when my my stepmom and my dad that when my biological mom died, I just wanted to go pee on her grave. Very aggressive. It's all I want to do. I just want to go pee when she dies. Don't care. Um, but it's very dominant. So you can use it in curse spells as well. Um, you can use urine in witches' bottles, freezer spells. You can carry um, urine to remove a curse. Um, and with intent, urine can be used in banishing spells. It's universal, so love and light as well as baneful, urine, blood, and semen all work for different types of spells. Using any of these fluids is a purely personal choice. When you're in my classes and we need any one of those fluids, I always provide an alternate. Actually two, because one's alcoholic and one's not alcoholic, and I'm not going to encourage a recovering alcoholic to have alcohol in their house. We, we try to provide the two. Um, alternate choices um, and if you are uncomfortable or repulsed by any of these fluids do not use them in love or healing spells because that repulsion will come through no matter how bad you want to do the spell no matter how bad you're pushing through to make it happen your subconscious is still going to enter and be repulsed and it's going to screw up your spell don't do it find something else go to the discord where we have 150 actually active members and somebody will have an answer for you on a different spell that you could do that doesn't require something that you find repulsive. But obviously for those who um, want to use a body fluid but you can't quite do blood for whatever reason or menstrual blood, semen, and I will tell you a little secret as a, as a, as a woman who's had four children, um, I don't always aim really well to pee on like a lemon. So I wrap it in foil and hand it to my husband and say, here, please go pee on my lemon. And since he doesn't know why, he can't influence my spell in any way, shape, or form. 
It's just the necessary ingredient. But for anybody who can't handle that, guess what? It's our mystery fluid, saliva, just spit on it. It contains the same essence. Uh, it's got all your DNA in it. It's got all of your intention in it. It's got all of your energy in it. Just spit on it. Makes it kind of, I know, I'm like, I, I'm not a big spitter. I struggle to come up with enough saliva for a DNA test, so I'm going to go for the blood. <laughs> Still spitting, I'm going to get the blood. Like, so it's just a personal choice. But they all have their value. talk about bones and skulls, so go from, we're going to bounce back and forth between dark and not so dark. I find it all fun. To me, there isn't. To me, painful magic and things like this, this is my light magic because I enjoy it so stinking much. Like, how can this be wrong? So, now we're going to talk about bones and skulls. So human remains, animal skulls, and then generally working with bones. Using a human bone and skull, or any part, is no different than using an animal bone. Please, again, it's all fun, but we are not robbing the graveyards. <laughs> no. They're expensive to buy, but we are not stealing, okay? I understand that, but we're not bringing bad juju home with us. Now, if you happen to go somewhere where a graveyard flooded, the blown bones are on the surface, leave an offering, take a ball. Okay, that's a little different. But we're not dig up, graving, digging up graves. No. But if you are working with a human versus an animal, the big, the big difference is the energy. Um... Human bones have human characteristics. So that means they can be used in spells to fulfill human needs and desires. A human spirit can find information, send messages, and assist with situations where you feel you don't have much control. They will have the same energy signature as the person had when they were alive. The same as, excuse me, the same as said for animal bones. So if the being had tra a traumatic event in life, it will sometimes bring that through the bones as well. If you do decide to use human remains in your practice, don't steal. There are many sellers that ethically source them because people still do donate their bodies to science or to things like this. Um, bless their hearts. It is, if you can, Get the lineage of your human bone that is amazing and most ethical sellers will have a certificate of authenticity and ownership that means it's been verified by the state or county or whatever their governing source is that it's okay for them to have that bone that it's okay for them to sell that bone I don't know there are three states I know that don't allow animals bones to cross borders. Like, I couldn't mail a bone to Jesse. Well, no, I couldn't mail a bone to Danny. Pennsylvania is one of those states that does not allow it, I think. Is it Pennsylvania? Tennessee, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, I think. I know Tennessee and Georgia, I forget who the other one is. This thing is Pennsylvania. Um, they don't allow you to, to cross state lines unless you're doing like an expo. And then you have to have all of your paperwork in line. Um, stealing from the dead is disrespectful and rude not only to them, but to their family. Um, do not buy it on the black market. Let's see. Yeah. No for, try to know for certain who they came from, or at least the country of origin. You know, that is sometimes helpful, too, because that will help you find their religious background oh, and cultural background. Uh, you can also 
use if you meditate or you work with divination to figure out the story of the bones. You just sit with them and become one with them and listen to the messages from the bone to find out what they, if they're willing to work with you and what they are willing to do if they do work with you. It's a two part. Are you willing to work with me? Are you willing to do these type of spells? You do want to connect with not just your bones, but every tool that you purchase. You do want to have that connection with them. You can do that by sleeping with them near your bed and ask them nicely to visit you in your dreams and reveal who they are. You can also hold it in your hands during meditation. Uh, when working with any bones, please remember to be respectful because they are still, that is a connection to them, even though they're on the spirit side. Working with human bones is different than working with animals because animals are pure creatures. Despite what Autumn is showing us now, which looks like joy and giddiness, um, animals don't know emotions like we do. So they don't know what hatred is. They don't know what evil is on the levels that we know. They know good, they know bad. That's it. That's what they know. They don't understand the nuances of each of those levels. But when you work with a human, the spirit can add to the emotional intention of the spell, and they can also help gather information on situations where you can't watch it. Some people believe the skull is the most powerful because that is where all the information is housed. And while an animal skull can connect us to the characteristics of the animal, a human skull connects us with the primordial essence of the human spirit and our earliest beginnings. An, an animal skull brings through the archetype of the animal. So, raccoons. I have like six raccoon skulls behind me that you guys can't see because I love raccoons. Raccoons are known for being trash diggers. Raccoons are known for being out at night. Raccoons are known for certain things. So we're going to come when we work with a raccoon, we work with all of that. When we work with a human, so if I had my grandmother's skull or some part of her, I would be working directly with the personality my grandmother had. Not all grandmothers, thank goodness. Because one I had was not so nice. So it's not an archetype of all grandmothers. It is that grandmother that I'm working with. And that's where the human-specific characteristics can come in. Um, of course, back not that long ago, yet all the way up through the 80s, mm, starting to become okay in the 90s, I want to say, where skulls became okay outside of heavy metal music and witchcraft and, you know, the satanic panic. Skulls are now literally everywhere. So now it's okay. Nobody thinks it's a big deal that I have six raccoon skulls sitting there. They're like, oh, that's cool. Some are decorated. Some are just, you know, plain. But now I don't have to hide them because skulls are cool. Which also makes me sad because I don't like doing what everybody else is doing. That's okay. Um, one of the things, also when working with humans, because it is a human, I am not going to want my children protected by the bones of someone who was a pedophile. You know. Like, that is not okay in my book. So I'm going to find the bones of someone who was protective and who did not have those deviances to protect my children if I use that spell. My grandmother was a God-fearing Christian woman, wife of a preacher. I'm probably not going to ask her to help me in some of my darker spells. It's just not who she is. She's here some cookies and banana pudding and eat some more kind of grandma, you know, not not real protective. So knowing who has your bone, you know, who is in your bone, knowing a little bit of their story, that's why it's very helpful. So in addition to extensive, there's a lot of research. And for those of you who know me, that is already way too much work. I'm sticking with animals. So I can just go with an archetype and not look up all the specific characteristics. I don't have the kind of time. I don't care. We stick with animals. Um, when it comes to animal bones, 
The skull is the best part of the animal to have on your altar because it represents a true connection. But all bones connect to the archetype of the animal. It's just that the brain is the most powerful. Um, take time to build a relationship with them. Make sure you don't just establish a connection one time and you're done. One of the best ways to explain it, let's see, I've never met Terry. I'm going to go knock on Terry's door and say, can I borrow a chair? And she's going to be like, uh, no. You're like, hey, Terry, I just moved in next door. You want to go grab some coffee? You want to chit chat sometime? We do that over time. And I might go ask Terry for a chair. She's like, here you go. Bring it back by Tuesday. I got my own function. But if I just show up and say, hey, can I borrow a chair? She's going to no so maintain that relationship with your tools just like you would with the people in your life that is that work. and i express when i meet a new tool a new ingredient a new anything well we connect i literally say look there's a reason i don't follow a religious path and that's because it requires work i'm going to leave you offerings out while I'm cooking because that's easy enough to do. When I come down here to this room where all my workings are, we're going to have conversation, but it's not necessarily going to be every week. It's not necessarily going to be every other week. Doesn't mean I'm not thinking about you. I am just not that person. And if they looked at my family, they would all understand that none of us communicate on a regular basis and we're all okay. So we, I, I just established that right up front with with everything. Hey, it's not that I don't appreciate you. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I don't want to work with you. These are the expectations. If you can manage that I'm the quiet friend who's only going to pop up every now and then, we're going to work together. That's also why I like animals. They don't care. Uh, so, also to remember, when you are working with the bones, these spirits are not your servants. They are your co-conspirators. They are your friends. They are your co-pilot. But they are not your servant. You still treat them with the same respect that you would if they were living and if they were your living co-conspirator, whether it be an animal or a human. It's not, go do this. Can you help me with this, please? They still have the right to refuse. You're like, eh, that's out of my league. We're not doing that. You're going to have to find somebody else because they have the right to say no. And we have the right, we have the responsibility to say, okay, we'll try something else then. What are you willing to help me with? Can you tell me who I should ask for help? Any of those things, okay? And it's just very important. Don't steal and don't order about as I'm ordering you not to order them about stuff. So. <laughs> um, but just even keeping them on your altar, wearing them, putting them in a Greek bag, ways to honor um, different things. Um, I am slowly, and by slowly, I mean it's been, what, like a year that I am making a bone painting or art project. Um, so it's a collage. I bought a bunch of bones and I'm still trying to figure out how to secure them so I can hang it up on my wall. It's just bones and dead flowers. So it's just to be part of my, what do they call it, aesthetic. Bones have also been used for divination, which I really, really, really think is awesome. And back when I started with Bear Bridge, we did have in the middle of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a bone reader come to town and do readings. And I was like, eh, I'm bored. I want to check her out. I want to see if she's legitimate. Like, is there somebody else out there? Is there is there a spirit friend out there? I can, like, yeah, somebody in town. I'm not the only outcast. But I went with zero expectations of her knowing anything and, and just blowing smoke in my ass. And she was stuck in the corner, like a storage room of our local bookstore. And she had all the aesthetic things that you need, you know, 
old rum bottle with wax dripping down the side and looking dirty and everything. And she had the cloth spread with pentagram on the on the table, and I was like, hmm, this is cool. Let's do this. Oh, she had an alligator head in one corner. It was really cool. So I was like, okay, she she presents with a nice show, and we talked, and I made sure not to reveal anything beyond yes, I was with my husband because he came along with me. But she was not getting anything from me. I am not falling for this. I am not revealing personal details, no age, no children, no nothing beyond what could be observed. Period. She threw these bones. And I looked down at the table, and what I see is a pop cap, a chicken foot, a bone from a chicken, like, wing, like she had for dinner at one point in her life, um, a button, like, just various things. And I was like, oh, whatever. This is going to be good. Can't wait to see what she's going to tell me. And as she read the bones, and she explained why these things were in her kids, and how they gave the answer to her. She was using them as a connection to spirit. These items had personal connection to her in some way. Turns out the, the, it was a chicken wing from a dinner she had, but it was a really amazing, like, girls night out kind of like epic thing. So she had a connection to that bone, so she put it in her collection. And I will say she was spot on, and now I can't find her, so it makes me very sad. But she did amazing using a chicken bone from an epic night out was whatever she did that she needed to save that and hold that in her special memories and use it in her bucket. So that is one way. And when I taught um, a night at the Psychic Guild, we kind of did bone divination because of that woman who blew my mind being spot on accurate, connecting through the bones and through the buttons and through the anything but a bone um, to make that connection to be Accurate enough that my husband went out and dropped about a reading to you and did one right behind. Like, she was good. So, what's what's next? I kind of revamped this slideshow right before class, so. And just for fun, we're going to do cursing and manipulation. So, give me just one second. There we go. Because it's, and there is a difference between binding and cursing. We're talking about signs of a curse and emotional involvement in these things. And apparently, my children are starting to blow my head. Binding in magic is a means of stopping someone from an action or behavior by energetically restraining them, it does not harm them. It stops them from completing an action. Whether it's an action against you, an action against themselves that is harmful, an action... I read a story, again on the interwebs, of a person who lived in an apartment complex, and the person on the balcony above would come out, and they'd be dropping their cigarettes below onto the balcony of the person below them who didn't smoke, but they would also be dropping their fingernail and toenail clippings that they would clip on the balcony onto the prop. Like, gross. So she wants to stop them, not from smoking. She doesn't want to stop them from smoking. She doesn't want to stop them from clipping their fingernails. She wants to stop them from doing it on the balcony and having it drop down below. So that's a good time to buy. Just stop that action. It doesn't hurt anyone. It sometimes can help. Curse them. On the other hand, is to actively send destruction or misfortune to someone. I actively want you to lose your job. That is a curse. I purposely and willfully want you to fall off the face of this planet or be buried six feet under. That is a curse. That is not a binding. A binding is a slap on the hand. Stop doing that. So that is... And how you choose, some people will never curse. Some people will Some people will find others to do it, and that's fine. That's why people like I exist. Um, I am also, if you hired me for a spell, I literally do have to ask you, are you wanting me to stop the action?
action or stop the person. Because I will go full bore. You're messing with my people. I will do whatever it takes necessary for you. So I have to ask, so I stay within my bounds, stay within what your conscious can handle. Um, one of the New Age religions has an emphasis on to do no harm and the threefold law. If you believe in that, amazing for you. I don't. Now, if you run into me with your shopping cart in the grocery store, I am neither going to bind you or curse you. I mean, not that kind of cursing anyway. I will probably swear a lot at you, but that's about as far as it's going to get. There are some people who will immediately curse them because they can and it's cool. We're not doing that. We're not We're not being petty buddies. The world doesn't, doesn't need that kind of nonsense. You literally swear at them. If they keep doing it, then maybe consider a binding or leave the grocery store and come back when they're not there. Like, let's let's not destroy the world. It's not what this is about. Um, so, and, and, and we're not like Oprah. You don't get a curse, you don't get a curse, you don't get a... Like, restrain, restrain, restrain. Curses are special. They're not given out to anything, to just everybody. Well, I am not a proponent of the threefold law. I am a proponent of think before you do. So, I prefer revenge best served cold, so I, I, I like to think about those things. But here is a, you know, simple meditation. Relax in whatever way makes you relaxed. Pet your cat, pet your dog, have a cup of coffee, just take off your shoes. If you're wearing one, take off your bra, whatever you need to feel comfortable. Just relax. And then see your person, whoever your enemy is standing in front of you, like they are there. You can physically see them in your mind's eye. They are there in front of you. Look at how they look. Feel their warmth. See them as the human that they are. This can sometimes be very difficult. When I first started doing this, I had a person who was a narcissistic wife beater. And it was very hard to see him as the human he was. But do it. And feel whatever reaction you feel. These will probably be negative feelings. It's fine. God, what is with my space? Two words. Um, allow the feeling to wash over you. As you have to work through it, to get to the next part. Then after your initial rush of emotion, you can focus away from your feelings and put yourself inside your enemy's body. Very difficult to do in some cases. I understand this. And this is just a sample. Do what works for you. But move your consciousness into their form. Your legs are now their legs. Your mouth and teeth are theirs. Feel their clothes on your body. And look at yourself through their eyes. What do you see? Don't project your feelings onto this. Just feel what happens when you look at yourself. Do you feel this can be resolved? You are now them. Is this a communication issue? Or not? Write down your questions. What do they feel? And if at the end of this, you feel that cursing is the way to go, go for it. But my favorite meditation nowadays is take three breaths and do it. Literally, take three breaths, I'm in my space, go do whatever I set out to do. Screw all this looking at myself through them. Uh -uh. Three breaths to ground and center, go. Some signs of a curse. Not all of these are going to be curses. Sometimes I'm old and experience random physical pain. Like when I fall getting into the bathtub and, and walking around on a very bruised and possibly fractured shin, I'm going to have random pain. But it's experiencing body pain that, body pain that flares and disappears with no underlying condition. It could be a sign. Of course, go to a doctor and rule out that there's anything wrong with your physical body. 
always go through the mundane first. You feel lethargic, mental cloudiness, and fatigue for no reason, and the feelings don't go away. Go see a doctor. Make sure there's nothing wrong with your thyroid and your hormone levels. See a therapist. Then maybe you're cursed. You have vivid nightmares that actually scare you. Little things pile up. You stub your toe, your cat gets sick, you break your favorite mug, your car breaks down. Like, is Mercury making lemonade or are you cursed? Hard to say. Your pets start acting strange around you. Animals can sense the low energy and they may be odd, acting, acting odd around you as a result. A cowering, barking, or acting like they see something you do not. You have relationships that break down. Small irritating fights keep stringing up between you and your loved ones, often over nothing in particular, yet you're annoyed at each other all the time. If communicating with your partner still does not fix that, you might be cursed. Start with communication. And you keep losing things. I had a week where I have literally lost everything one at a time. High, low, can't find anything anywhere. Turns out I wasn't cursed. There was a little spirit telling me I didn't eat those things right this minute and went hit shit. Because then it would just randomly reappear after I accepted I didn't need it. It's fine. Other signs to be ongoing colds and minor health issues at one after another. After another just can't get better and it's not COVID or long COVID. Maybe take a look and the doctor says there's nothing wrong with you, it's all in your head. Maybe it's a curse. Communication, not only between your partner, but everything just suddenly breaks out. Nobody is hearing you. You haven't changed the words you use, but now you're not making sense and people are misinterpreting everything you say. That might be a curse. All the plants in your home or garden might die for no apparent reason. So, um, I went to deliver a curse astrally to someone who was a very, very mean person. And the first thing I did was attack their basil. I sprinkled that curse all over, all over basil in her windows, in her front garden, and everywhere. Something I learned by doing that was that she had the mother plants and the babies that she gave to friends to start their own basil protection, those babies died as a result as well, unfortunately. So, if you, I, I always recommend basil because it will let you know if an attack happens. It will die for no reason. I'd be worried about what's happening. Unless you're me or Danny, we cannot grow green things. If a plant is dead in our house, it's our fault. It's because it was our plant. I can't keep hydroponic plants alive. Uh-uh. If a plant dies in my house, it's my own. It's because somebody gave it to me. That's why. Um, and then there is the obvious sign if you find a jar of nails and urine on your property. That's a pretty clear sign you're cursed. Like, that isn't a maybe, kind of, oh, I stubbed my toe six times this week. That's a, here's a curse on your doorstep. So things you can do. Create a protective barrier around yourself every morning. And it can just be energetic shield. Um, but you can also use basil. You can carry basil with you and other protective herbs and crystals. Um, to, you can perform protection spells. Carry a mirror charged with deflective energy. Take ritual cleaning baths. Cut energetic ties. If you can communicate psychically and follow energetic signatures psychically, you can figure out who put the curse on you and you can make sure you've cut ties with them. Um, write this is the name of the suspected curser on a bay leaf and burn it. And perform a home cleansing ceremony and then pour witch's salt around the perimeter of your property. Also bear in mind that your mental 
elemental powers are just as strong as any curse, and if you wish to blot out bad energy, you can absolutely do so through repeated visual visualization. I will probably forget about day two or day three that I'm supposed to be doing repeated visualizations or taking a ritual. My attention span is not that long. So, thankfully, blessedly, our headmaster has created this wonderful video that takes about five minutes to break a curse, so we're going to watch that. Sadness is a low energy vibration and it is slower to deliver. 
It can feel like a gut punch, and you can return to center. Crying is normal. We want you to feel those emotions, being in touch with your emotions, whether it's anger, sadness, happiness. You're putting that into your spell. Be in touch with them. And here's a tricky one. Jealousy. That can consume a person. Very much so. This is an emotion that is not about anyone but you. Jealousy is purely a you issue. No one else can cause you to be jealous. That is all you. So cursing or binding does not tame jealousy, and it's better to use shadow work. For those who are unfamiliar with shadow work, it's basically therapy. You're seeing a therapist, you're working on these emotions, why are you jealous, what can you do to help with that kind of emotion, what can you do instead, how can we work through it and get to the emotions that we want to feel. Whether you go to therapy, I think everybody needs a therapist, I don't care if you're having a good week or bad week, I think a therapist needs to be in everybody's life so that way when shit does hit the fan you're not trying to build a relationship at the same time you're going through a crisis you already have a relationship built even if you only see them once a month uh, but otherwise journal 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 meditate work through those emotions get to the root cause five whys start with a what what am i feeling why am i feeling that why am i feeling that you know, work through the five whys to get to the roots, and you should, and maybe it'll take you a while to get through it, and that's fine, but that, I recommend shadow work if you are feeling, um, jealousy, um, and sometimes the desire to curse is selfish and has very little to do with the target, orally fine, that's where having shadow work and a therapist on a regular basis can help you be in touch with those kind of feelings and know is it a you or is it a me that's important um, and a lot of us have been raised not to express the negative emotions don't cry don't be sad you know you have to be happy you can't be angry why are you angry who said you could be angry I didn't say you could be angry like I'm not angry why are you angry I heard that a lot in my second marriage. I don't understand why you're crying. I'm not sad. <laughs> Good for you, buddy. Good for you. I'm sad. I'm mad. I'm angry and I have the right to be, but I didn't feel like it until I was 44 years old that I could have those emotions. <clears throat> so that was quite where the shadow work would help. But identify the emotion. Put a name to it. Own it. I'm angry. I own it. I don't care. Um, so, yeah. So just be, be aware of your emotions. They're called interpersonal skills when you talk to another person. I feel blank because blank. And when you're talking to another person, the other person says, I feel, I hear, I see, or I can relate. That is healthy communication. That is not discounting your feelings. That is not telling you not to feel your feelings. They are hearing you. They are letting you feel that. If they don't curse them, that's my answer to everything. If they don't let you feel your feelings, just curse them. And now we're talking about sacrifice. In the purpose of scientific and educational only, because Bear Bridge does not endorse human sacrifice. Or whatever. Not judging. So when people think of sacrifice, all sorts of visions run through people's mind, but ultimately, no matter the envision, they all involve bloodshed. And usually some form of a photo. Different backdrop, different person on the table, different whatever, but ultimately this is what it looks like at the barest form. Um Sacrifice is probably the most misunderstood, however, and feared ritual. Um, it brings images when I would say sacrifice. 
people start thinking of torture and cannibalism and devil worshipping rituals. Um, the true meaning is actually none of those things. Sorry to disappoint. Sadness, it's not that dark. It has been seen throughout history all across the globe. In every society throughout time, there has been sacrifice. It bridges cultures completely unconnected to each other, which tells us this is an innately human ritual. It is not a cultural ritual. It is not a geographic ritual. It is a human ritual. It is in all of us. Um, many people don't realize just how ingrained sacrifice is in our everyday life. Like everything, Sacrifice is cyclical. It has its ebb and its flow, and it cycles like the seasons or the moon. It's all about offering something, literally anything of value, to a more powerful force, and it's asking for good treatment in return. Doesn't matter your religion, your background, everybody sacrifices. There are several reasons for sacrifice. One is a funerary sacrifice where a leader when a leader died people and animals were killed to go with the leader to the afterlife it was an honor to go with the leader of your community your king your whoever to go to the afterlife when they died your pharaoh another reason was to gain favor with the gods to ensure survival and ward off natural disasters and the third reason for sacrifice was actually divination it has evolved into the more peaceful sacrifice of food and libations to the deity of your choice. You know, if I'm, if I'm eating a pack of cheese crackers, I can put one on my altar because I have now sacrificed some of my food to the deity on my altar. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be bloodshed and all that gore anymore. Instead of doom scrolling my phone at night, before I go to bed, I can flip that down and sacrifice that time off my phone. I can, you know, do those kind of things as a sacrifice instead of a whole body. Um, the most well-known uh, culture with funeral sacrifices was actually the ancient Egyptians. So it was whole communities and animals were sacrificed over the time they realized hey population's kind of dwindling just a little bit so they used statues and idols instead which is still or you know an honor um let's see what we talked about uh, there was a time where historically accurate is that a person would be chosen as a sacrifice to a deity. But what Hollywood does not show or talk about or is not talked about in the books is that person who offered themselves as sacrifice to appease the gods was treated as the most revered person in the community. They lived a life of luxury up until the day of sacrifice. They were waited on hand and foot. They were denied nothing because they were so in such an honored position that they have given up their life. It's not about a virgin sacrifice. It literally could have been any person in the village who was giving themselves up to this was treated amazingly. And because the belief was that the more special the offering, the happier the gods would be. So it wasn't someone who was tortured and drugged against their will. It was literally someone who was revered and treated amazingly and given to the gods willingly. And the Greeks, were, they're, they're so amazing. I love the Greeks. They used sacrifice for divination. They would sacrifice bulls, sheep, and goats in a place called the Oracle, and a priestess would enter a trance, and divinity would um, talk, communicate through her after the appropriate offerings were made. Animal sacrifice was very commonplace during those times. The armies marching to war, because, you know, we didn't have modern mechanized transportation, armies marching to war would bring flocks of sheep and goats with them. They would use these animals 
to determine each and every move they should make. Should we go east or should we go west? Let's sacrifice a sheep. And read the, um, not only the blood trails, like the blood splatter, they would also look at the twitches as the animal was dying. And, um, yeah, like blood splatter, what the entrails said, the blood well, throws. So, there are some recent cases of human sac. By recent, I don't mean in this millennium. I just mean in the grand scheme of 65,000 years of spirituality that we're not going back to. So there are some recent cases of sacrifice, but we're, they weren't necessarily religious in nature. Um, and animal sacrifice occurs all the time, which is fine because we still have very primitive cultures. And they, here's the other thing about animal sacrifice that Hollywood does not talk about because that would not be any good. When a goat, a sheep, a bull, whatever was sacrificed, and then put on the pyre to burn. Once it got done cooking, the whole community ate that. They didn't just let it burn and go to waste. It would feed the entire village. Because they weren't wasteful. So it looks amazing. But they were really just cooking dinner. But they had to put the time, the energy, and effort, which is why it's a sacrifice. Um, but we all cook our meals. Most of us cook our meals. There are some people who eat the raw food diet, so can't exclude them. But people will cook their meat. They will serve it up on a tray. They will pray to the deity of their choice, and then they will eat. The only difference between that and a Hollywood sacrifice is the intention. One we're feeding and one we're glorifying for TV. It's literally the same thing every single day. Um, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, in addition to stranger danger, we had satanic panic. Um, where going back all the way to even Pliny the Elder still and talking about our stupid witches, that there have been false, um, we've been linked to murder and baby sacrifice for years. Look at the fables, look at Disney, the biggest perpetuator of misinformation about witches. Oh, there's a kitty. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I get easily distracted by animals. Um, but they Disney perpetuates this stereotype. Hansel Gretel, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, all of them. The truth is, witches really didn't perform sacrifice, humans did. It was humans, not a specific class of witches. It was humans. All over the world, all people of all races and religions have performed sacrifices in some way. But the thing that has not disappeared in all these stories is that Satans are wor Satan worshippers who eat babies, which cast the witch as a child-killing, bloodthirsty ghoul, even in 2023. My highly educated, multi-degreed, and multi-certificated head counselor who is in charge of all of us women, if you see a tarot card, that woman almost faints because of the misconceptions. But oh, don't touch, don't touch Native American medicine bag. Oh no, no, no. They get those. Don't even look at them, just let them have them. But man, show a tarot card and that woman just like panics. It is amazing to watch this woman who has traveled with the Air Force and now is a counselor and exposed to all these things freaking panic over a tarot card. But don't touch the medicine bags. So, even today, there is that um, stereotype attached to us. Um, the, the Salem witch trials, women were forced into confessions because of the torture. They just finally wanted it to end, and they said whatever the, they wanted, the torturers wanted to hear. Um, some outlandish accusations made at that time were that, um, hold on, we're going to here. 
Witches can fly through the air to a Sabbath where they would eat human flesh, have sex with the devil or large goats, participate in orgies, and sacrifice babies to Satan and drink blood. The rec- those confessions were recorded as fact, and the link to witches and murder was made. And although the, by the 19th century the burnings had stopped, the impact is still here to this day. It is scary. <clears throat> it is scary to think that throughout time, you know, and we did talk about modern sacrifice, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit, um, but it's literally giving up anything of your own, time, money, food, clothing, in order to appease a deity or spirit. It doesn't have to be blood. It doesn't have to be an animal. Please don't, unless you plan on eating it. Give up a little bit of your dinner. Give up a little bit of your time to just sit and meditate. Um, there is one Loa that loves to just have a cigar with you and listen to jazz music. Like, that's sacrificing some time to spend with them to appease him. Very simple. You don't have to light the cigar, you can just put it there for, for him. Like, it's fine. But that is something you can do to appease. And we are not going to perpetuate the stereotype in any way, shape, or form that witches are evil and we sacrifice. And then, there's not really 31 slides, I promise. Okay. Uh, why did it go back? talk about what we have sacrifice and we're gonna talk about death and death rights real quick death is a part of everyday sights everyday life our skin our hair our nails plants animals trees all of that is part of the cycle of life and death um but it's very hushed up people talk about it in regular times if they don't consider that death and birth are two sides of the same coin because you cannot have birth without death and you cannot have death without rebirth. The moon dies in the sky every 28 days only to reemerge as a brand new white slice of potential. Um, so it is not an end, it's just a transition. Our bodies also do this as we die and drop seeds, our children, um, or our creations or whatever we've contributed in our life and then we become earth as our body decomposes which creates food to feed our future life I, our souls embark on a similar journey when our body dies our soul is part of something much bigger just as our physical body is part of the larger functions of the earth cycle our soul dissipates into a larger energy body or the cosmos or across the veil is just not here where the cycle is leading no one knows but the notion is that there is paradise after death. I prefer the Luciferian concept of there is paradise now. I'm not in the mood to wait until I die to find paradise. I want it now. I'm going to live my life now. I'm going to do my best to honor nature and be respectful to others until they're not to me. In the now. So that's where I really like Luciferian and Stragaria. Um, both of those are very nice. Um, you know, and then there's also death in a different way. Ending a job, especially one that makes you unhappy, that's death of unhappiness. You're going to be happy. I experienced that in six months ago. I said, I'm tired of being unhappy, death to unhappiness, and now I'm in a job that even after the end of a 15 hour day, I am looking forward to going back the next day. Like, that was an ending. That is what a death is. A death is an ending. Um, a lot of people, and I know you all have pets, and they're absolutely freaking adorable, and I, I love staring at the pets. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're familiar. A lot of people with a <laughs> my dogs are my, my dog is kind of a familiar, and my cat is my daughter's familiar, but not mine. Um, a lot of people keep their familiar's remains after they pass by making a casket and describing it with um, different symbols of eternal life or something that meant something to you and your familiar. 
Um, and you can do this with a person as well. Um, actually, I've turned this topic into a class at Bear Bridge Academy of Death Fascinates You, and you want to be an understanding and empathetic person and make sure that a person can live fully as they die. Death Doula is coming up in January, and um, we will be working on people with people who are dying to help them cross over. But there are different ways that you can honor the dead. It has been done throughout the Egyptians built pyramids as tombs to their pharaohs that is part of death it wasn't hey I'm bored let's just build this great big triangle out in the middle of nowhere and throw body they that's that's not how that worked they put thought they sacrificed their I don't know who sacrificed the time and the labor. I mean, it's kind of iffy on which, you know, were they slaves? Was it biblical? Like, whatever. I don't, I don't know. I don't really believe the Bible, and I don't really believe Hollywood, so here we are. But they still sacrificed to make these tombs for these Egyptian pharaohs to honor them in their passing. They sacrificed communities to go with them until they realized that the population was dwindling and started using idols instead and statues must be a really good rag ball with Yanny over there <laughs> I can tell Jesse's laughing I'm like why are you laughing Jesse so those are the different ways but um when you work with all of these things, so let's see if I have more here. Yeah, okay. So it's important when you're working in darker side of things. In general, I'm pro- a proponent of mental health, but emotional stability. That you've looked at yourself long and hard, you've accepted your truth. You're not wishy washy, you have accepted your truth. You might have to change from within if you don't already know that. and. Once you do, you, you get a calm acceptance, which will also give you inner strength to do the things that you didn't think you could do, risks you wouldn't take, hardships you never thought you'd be able to endure. Exercise is a muscle for your body. Shadow work is a muscle for your spirit. A forgiving heart is up to you whether or not you have one. There are some things I don't feel can be forgiven in life, but that is my personal opinion. But you may, finding a forgiving heart may open you up to seeing the other side and discovering that maybe it was a miscommunication. But if not, it's okay. No one's asking you to. You might find that there's less desire to cause harm. I'm sorry. Um, It also gives you an acceptance of endings, of death. It helps with the grief process. Um, and gives you a better understanding of physical death, gives you a connection to animal life and nature. I do absolutely all of these things and stay grounded in nature and in who I am as myself. I am I'm not uncomfortable being the dark magic teacher like I thought I would have been maybe in my twenties and I was so worried about whatever he thought of me. I reach the age, I don't care. I am who I am. I accept that. And I try to provide a safe space for everybody to feel that too. Um, And it's nice being comfortable with who I am and what I am. And, you know, not everybody knows me, but in addition to working for an addiction treatment center, I am working, I am a social worker. I am a counselor. I am a person who gives and gives to those who are willing to accept the hand up. So it's not all about cursing. I do balance myself, but I have accepted that both parts are of the whole. You know, like, I can be both, and I can be okay. And that's what Bear Bridge, what my class is, are about is just giving you the tools even if you only use them in my classes um, which I just covered without going far into slides 
The Mystic Circle. If you enjoy hands-on type things, the Mystic Circle meets them twice a month. And they do four-ish spells, I think, each week. I haven't been in so long because I've been working Saturdays. Um, but Headmaster Alley leads from all over the world. We've done Japan. We've done root work. We've done different... That's all I know. And then we also have watch parties of witchy movies about once a month, I think. Um, just to kind of have bonding and community time. And then Doc Dilla is a new course coming up. It's a six-week course to prepare you for assisting the dying with living the fullest and ensuring that their legacy lives on. Um, you become an emotional support human kind of deal, which is important to understand all the aspects and self-healing. Also, coming up, I think, look, I know that this is my last week for two weeks, so I'm not worried about what happens after that right now, but I think it's in January. I will also be teaching a root worker. So if you like working with herbs, you like working with the Bible, you like um, all those different aspects and working with um, like New Orleans magic, then root work would be the class for you. It is not voodoo because voodoo is a closed religion. This is hoodoo type work because it takes the religious aspect out of it and is the witchcraft only part. So if that work appeals to you, root work is also coming up in January. Just some classes that I'm teaching and then keep an eye on BearBridgeAcademy.com because I think Allie has most of the classes listed and you'll see Danny and myself and Miss Nancy. Jessie's everywhere these days. She joined BearBridge and it was a little slow but now she's literally everywhere as a student so you'll see Jessie out and about as well um, offering Discord and other than that, were there any other questions for tonight? Stop sharing.